Yes, good afternoon. I'm pleased to be here again after a long trip. Instead of walking across the sea or the river, <laughs> we had a very a sightseeing tour in Israel and in Jordan. So uh, this is one of the things that we should bring up, that we have one little area and we should be able to cross this river and also cross many bridges uh, more easily. I'm saying this also because my friend Professor Abu Bele also had a hard time reaching our meeting in Tel Aviv last, year, uh, last week. Uh, but we had an excellent meeting and a meeting of minds and a meeting of hearts. And uh, we hope to make, talk about something practical. In fact, what I'd like to say is we want a shopping list. We know there are problems. We know the, uh, the, 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 the things that prevent uh, the sharing of water. We're talking here about water, of course. And, um, but we'd like to have a shopping list of what we would do if we had a dream world, if we had everything as it could be. Not as it should be even, but as it could be. So first of all, I think Professor Abu Mele from Al-Hassar University uh, will tell us his view. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Uh, ladies and gen uh, gentlemen, uh, first of all, uh, and uh, on behalf of myself and uh, Palestinian people, especially Gazans, I would like to express my uh, deepest gratitude to all the organizers for their great and sincere efforts to make this circle event happen. The gratitude is extended to the Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, it is authority and people for hosting this important event and for their kind uh, generosity and hospitality and the importance of Jordan, a great region effort in supporting its neighbors, especially Palestine, and to make the Middle East a better place to live in. Uh, if we move to talk about the water crisis in Gaza Strip, really my presentation is only some information about Gaza, not more than that. Some facts, which is we need to know. Uh, I will talk about the water crisis in Gaza Strip because it is a multi-dimensional multi protected crisis with a combination of uh, political, environmental, geographical, economical, social, and the humanitarian perspective. Where is that? Uh, um, oh, please. Which one? This is the study area to view a global map, and then this is the Gaza Strip, which is a very small area. I think it's clear here. 365 square kilometer. Uh, this is the total area of Gaza Strip. Uh, Egypt border, 11 kilometers in the south, and Israel border, 51 kilometer. But about the total population, which is now 2 million people. Uh, we will talk first about the humanitarian facts. Uh, ten years a blockade, uh, minus 50% GDP, uh, 48, 43, sorry, unemployed, 60% young, 80% uh, aid dependent, a dual use items, 
reconstruction, 45% of 47, uh, 40, 70 uh, megawatt is met. Uh, 12 to 18 uh, plugged hour, uh, plugged out hours. Uh, GBP operated with 50% capacity. This some humanitarian facts about Gaza. Right. Uh, a plus 70% H HC rec receive water uh, six to eight hours once every four days. 80%, 10% of, uh, of has access to save a drinking water. 10% only access to save a drinking water. 96% of the Gazans soil water uh, sources is unfit for a human consumption. 95% at risk of waterborne disease. 90 million liters sewage to the Mediterranean every day. What is the challenges? This is some facts. First of all, the blockage. I cannot explain, and you know, every, I think everybody knows what's the meaning of the blockage. Uh, recurrent conflict. The depletion of the coastal aquifer. People are left with no choice but to relay, uh, relay on contaminated water. Contaminated water. Really, this is the blockage. This is the map. Lift it flow. And here we will go uh, for each items one by one. But this is only, this is a wash cluster map as well. What's the meaning of recurrent conflict? The uh, already dire wash situation was further deteriorated by the recent war as Israeli articles uh, caused approximately 34 million US dollars damage to wash infrastructure. The depletion of the coastal aquifer, the aquifer is being over exploited by up to three times its sustainability yield, decades of over bumping, as well as the contamination resulting from the nitrogen of wastewater, agrochemicals, and silane water have put the aquifer in danger, in danger of irreparable damage. 96% of the water extracted from the coastal aquifer is already unfit for a human consumption, 96. 95% of the Gaza population depends on desalinated water, purchased from private vendors of drinking. 68% of this water contains biocontaminates, yet it is a price so prohibitive that the most vulnerable household in Gaza end up spending up to their, of their income of water. Of the third, sorry, of their uh, income of water. Uh, this is the, we move here uh, to the coastal aquif, uh, the cross section, our hydrological cross section, just to have an idea This is the aquifer here, sorry, 
uh, we have in the middle uh, about 10 kilometers, which is in the, in the blue line. Uh, and then all the water is supposed to move from the east to the west, to the sea. And we, this is where in the west we have the sub-aquifers, which is, we call it A, B1, B2, and C. And underneath of it, we have uh, the Sakya group, uh, which is uh, really, this is uh, confirmed or contained uh, Ceylon water. We cannot go further uh, in this aquifer. A problem are left with no choice up to, uh, but to rely on uh, contaminated water. You see here, nine out of 10 people in the Gaza Strip drink desalinated water. This water is a product uh, produced by those desalination plant. Concerns about its quality have been raised in the past. And recent study by W. BWA, uh, BWA, Palestinian Water Authority, confirmed those claims. Number two, out of the existing 154 public and the private desalination plant, only 48 of them are licensed by the uh, designated authorities posing issues to their monitoring, only 48. Now, we go to the uh, uh, people, Aidan, including, uh, incidence of total coliform, TC, is as high as 68% at the household, uh, supermarket, storage level. In, order, in other words, 68% of the desalinated water currently being consumed in Gaza Strip is uh, susceptible to biological contamination due to the combined effect of uh, an adequate dis uh, disinfection at the desalination plant, the improper um, handling during the distribution and poor users' storage uh, habits. Now, uh, Gaza water facts. 98% uh, of the Gaza water supply comes from uh, groundwater, which, face, which faces a high level of abstraction, 200 million cubic meter per year. This is the total the total uh, consumption uh, per year, 200 million cubic meter. Uh, for uh, different, pur all the purposes, I mean, for uh, domestic and for agriculture purposes. For times higher, for, four times uh, higher than the annual recharge average, which is 55 to 60 million cubic meter per year. I just mentioned that this morning uh, during our discussion, we only have, uh, we have only the total precipitation 110 to 120 million cubic meter per year. But unfortunately, as I, I mentioned, we lose about more than 50% of this water going to the sea, uh, in the street, whatever. And then uh, the only natural recharge, uh, 50, 55 to 60 million cubic meter per year. This is the actual na natural recharge in the Gaza Strip until now. Uh, 96 percent of the Gaza water supply is contaminated with an accountable high level of nitrate, NO3, and the chloride posing significant health risk to Gaza's uh, two million residents. Really, uh, this is 96. We carry these analysis by myself in my laboratory at Al Azhar University, and I have been follow these analysis for the last 20 years. 
I find it, it is increased gradually. But this is the last result which I got. Due to current high abstraction level, coastal aquifer will be unusable by 2016. And irreversibly damage in 2020. This is the record, this is uh, depend on the uh, UN reports, which is 2012. According, accordingly, most of Gazan population res resort to an accounted, uh, an uncontrolled, uh, desalinated water from a private vendors or household to score drinking water. Despite that, Gaza's water supply is estimated at 90 liters per capita per day. Maybe we will find it higher, but unfortunately, this is the water which is most of it uh, saline water or a brackish water. However, this falls below the acceptable water quality and the quantity, sta quantity standard recommended by the WHO. Absence of an adequate wastewater treatment facilities, approximately 35 million cubic meter per year of untreated, partially treated sewage is uh, dumped into the sea along Gaza coastal. Additionally, 12 million cubic meter per year of untreated, partially treated sewage infiltrated to the coastal aquifer. And now the, the problem becomes more complicated because we lose the power, we don't have electricity to run the uh, treatment plant uh, in the whole Gaza Strip, I mean. Not only in the Gaza City, all, all of them. Okay, two minutes. Water uh, consumption for agriculture purposes exceeds 48% of the available groundwater, more than 95 uh, million cubic meter per year. Gazans water and sanitation a crisis will worsen while population is expected to reach 2.1, maybe more, in 2020 in uh, conjunction with the projected water demand to grow to 260 million cubic meter uh, in 2020 for different uses. Currently, an installed power supply to operate water and wastewater facilities is estimated by 29 megawatt. Meanwhile, projected power supply demand for water and wastewater facilities is estimated by 81.5 megawatt in 2020, a blackout of 12 to 16 hours a day are restricting the provisions of the basic services. Right, now, uh, uh, rain, uh, really uh, amount of rain, 312 milliliter per year, which is uh, 45 millimeter in the north, 200 millimeter in the south. We call, this is 110 and 120. Uh, domestic consumption, 70 to 90 liter per capita. Uh, water exploitation is about 200 million cubic meter. Uh, natural replenishment of the aquifer, 300, 35 to 45 million cubic meter per year. Uh, this is uh, some information. I think we have some of it. Maybe we can go on. Right. Uh, we have the last one. Water wells. We have a 12,500, which is 250 registered, which is a legal one, and about 10,000, which is illegal. 
maybe we'll, we can come back to these things. Just only map, this is the show the water equality map. This is the water level. I am not going to talk, uh, just only to show the map. Uh, uh, I think the map show the salinity and the rate of the salinity. We talk about that. Uh, come back to this if necessary. This is the nitrate, finish, Maryam. Yeah. Nitrate and the chloride map as well. Uh, this is only show graph to show the water equality. I mentioned the figures. Uh, this is what the, what the demand, okay, uh, uh, for uh, UFW and for efficiency of the about 58 uh, average water network. And the energy, we explain electricity demand has reached 470 megawatt and the shortage reach about 55 percent. Okay. Well, yeah, I think. Uh, uh, thank I think you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Yosef. Uh, we, it's important to know what are the problems and uh, to make a diagnosis, but now we need treatment. So we want to know, I think, what can be done? We know there's a problem and it's interesting to hear the specifics of the problem, of what's, uh, what the patient needs. But let's see what can be done. Because it seems to me in this area that something can be done. And actually, just as we have established an understanding and a friendship, we hope that we can have some practical uh, suggestions. And I call it a shopping list. What do we need? And in this area, what is so frustrating is that there is a technical possibility, or there could be technical possibilities. So let's discuss them. For instance, today I drove all the way from uh, Tel Aviv, all the way north and all the way south on the other side. So there is a way. There's a plane, maybe at the right times. Maybe we need another plane every day. Good afternoon. You can hear me well, I hope. Um, Yes, so we only just arrived after a very long trip here, but we're very happy to finally be here and I'm very thankful for the organizers to uh, invite uh, myself and of course uh, the Office of the Quartet, who I'm sort of representing here. Um, I'm the water advisor of the Office of the Quartet since two years. Um, we've been working not only, but for a long term, uh, very much focused on Gaza, uh, very much focused, of course, on uh, the, the particular interventions that exist uh, at the moment uh, to alleviate the water crisis and also focused on the Gaza desalination project. Um, before, I, So in this presentation, I kind of want to illustrate what are the main interventions uh, to address the water and wastewater crisis in Gaza um, based on the PWA strategy of 2011, which uh, is already uh, dated, but is still being rolled out as, as we speak. They have now an updated strategy that builds on um, these main interventions. Um, but as a kind of disclaimer, say, or key points that I want to mention beforehand um, are three, three main issues. First of all, if all the interventions that are following in this presentation are actually being rolled out um, as they are at the moment and as they are being completed, we still need um, bulk water. Gaza still needs bulk water, um, drinking water and water for domestic use at the immediate uh, term, which can only come from water import, bulk water import from Israel. The second main point is that every um, water solution that is mentioned here in, in particularly uh, water desalinating uh, infrastructure and wastewater treatment infrastructure needs reliable energy, needs long-term energy supply. Um, in this regard, the Office of the Quartet, my colleagues uh, from the energy team are working specifically on the Gas for Gaza project, which is a project uh, that will provide hopefully long-term gas supply um, to Gaza from, from Israel. Um, and the third important point is the, the, the implementation of all these interventions actually require a viable water sector as is needed also in a viable energy sector. This means that there should be regulation, there should be um, cost recovery mechanisms, uh, unified tariffing structures, etc., which is very important if you want to think about the long-term operation and maintenance of, of some of these interventions. 
Um, so going into, diving into the, uh, the presentation, so I see that there are two points um, that disappeared from the uh, presentation. We're going to blame that to the cyber attack that happened this weekend and uh, has actually interfered our email system as well, interestingly. So, um, but I'll just uh, explain, the, the, we'll, we'll go through them in the presentation at different points. So this is, the, this is the nine interventions identified by PWA in 2011 um, that should be rolled out in parallel and if completed will address um, the water and wastewater crisis in Gaza sufficiently. Um, so we'll, we'll go over the uh, points, the main points as we speak. So um, I think in every kind of intervention that relies on infrastructure, technology, etc., you need to take into account the current situation of the domestic water distribution network in Gaza, which needs um, rehabilitation. At this moment, there, is, there are water losses up to 40% in the network due to a variety of causes. Um, uh, and one of the key focuses while you are implementing infrastructure um, or even when you want to import extra water from, um, say, outside from uh, Israel, for, ex for example, you will need um, an expanded capacity of the network, including also the connection points to Gaza. Um, and you will also need to implement a strategy um, that focuses on reducing that non-revenue water so that you implement also cost recovery mechanisms, but also that you reduce the actual physical leakages in, in the piping system. Um, so I think when my colleague here spoke about 90 liters um, per day, if I remember correct, I think after uh, calculations we made previously, it might not even be that 90 liter because when it reached the consumers, we're talking about maybe not even half because of the, the non-revenue water. Um, so this is, a, this is a very big issue. It's a big issue in the West Bank as well. Um, but just to say the... The Water Authority now, in their future strategy, um, has a new non-revenue water strategy, which you can, I think, even access online. Um, and second, as part of the large-scale desalination project, which I will talk about in a minute, um, there is also a, a consultant that is focusing specifically on addressing the non-water revenue component. So, um, in parallel, these uh, interventions are, are uh, being rolled out at the moment. Um, as a second important intervention, as we said, is, uh, as I said, is, is increased Im imports from Israel, um, drinking water. Um, start, I mean, we already heard about where the crisis stems from and that the main issue is that Gaza is entirely rel uh, reliant on the coastal aquifer, which is polluted. So they need extra resources. Uh, these can come from, um, from different in interventions through desalination and also water imports. Um, the main point, we, uh, I understand that there has been already a discussion about the Red Dead Agreement. Um, so just building on that, um, within the framework of this agreement, there has been also a bilateral agreement between uh, Israel and the Palestinians that dates from 2013, which would, when implemented, provide, um, say, through a, uh, a sale of uh, water, provides 20 MCM to the West Bank and 10 uh, million cubic meter to Gaza. Now, our, uh, we just released a report on uh, water issues in the framework of the um, periodic HLC meetings on which we also urge the both parties to reach an agreement on implementing um, this, this uh, memorandum of understanding because it would make 10 MCM available uh, tomorrow, so to speak. Um, we know that the connection points and the reservoirs that needed to be um, rehabilitated on the Gaza uh, side have been um, up, have been upgraded and can receive so Gaza can receive the 10 MCM um, but now it's a matter of reaching an agreement on uh, costing uh, and, and pricing um, so we are hopeful that an ag agreement in this sense is close by and that those 10 MCM would be a stepping stone for further imports in the in the immediate term um, third, what is currently being rolled out is a short-term low-volume desalination plant so that our small-scale desalination plants uh, funded by the European Union and implemented by UNICEF 
Um, the first phase of these uh, desalination plants are already in working. They are inau uh, inaugurated in January. Um, and now, and this goes back to what the key points that I mentioned in the beginning, um, now they are facing electricity shortages. So the whole, they actually managed um, to, to operate and install this plant, which has been a tremendous challenge, uh, considering uh, many aspects, financing, but also the fact that many of those materials needed are dual use material. Um, it needed a consistent engagement of the UN, of the uh, EU and the Palestinian Water Authority to make this happen. Um, and now there is, um, uh, unfortunately, there needs to be reliable energy before they can step up their efforts and also implement um, phase two and three. Um, but this is, a, this is a fantastic project and if it can be expanded, it would be, uh, it would be a great alternative to provide uh, desalinated water, drinking water on a smaller scale uh, and in a shorter term. Um, fourth is the big scale desalination project, so PWA ha still has as a priority project um, a large scale desalination facility that is comparable to the ones in Israel, comparable to the one in Ashkelon for example, which in a first phase could desalinate up to 55 million cubic meter, but if it could be updated um, in a period of 2-3 years after the first operation, it could go to 110-120 million cubic meter. Um, looking, I mean, it's, it's a very complex project, there are many important um, stakeholders working continuously with PWA to make the implementation happen, um, but unfortunately there are, very, there are very important challenges to take into account and as, again they are not um, just financial, which of course this um, project requires 600 million um, US dollars. It's 562, but um, I think we can expect that the, this amount will grow over time. Um, it also needs a reliable energy supply, um, which and there is there are feasibility studies. Um, also, at least the conceptual design is available for whoever is interested. So, I don't really want to go into the whole, all the technical details of the plans. Um, but combined with a natural gas line from uh, Israel, this could be um, a, a good solution to address a, a high gap of water, a high demand of water. Um, but this is only in the, say, intermediate term, um, because the plan still, we still need to resolve a few issues um, related to governance, related to uh, energy asset, related to the outstanding finances. Um, so it could be operational, say, five years from now, and still in the immediate term. And as we saw already, also 2020 is very close. I also don't think we necessarily have to stick to 2020 as the the uh, D day that is, that is going to be apocalypse. I think the apocalypse, apocalypse is already here. Um, so there should be an alternative solution in the immediate term um, preceding the large diesel. Um, and of course, as we also uh, heard from the previous talk, the wastewater issue is, is very important, also needs a sustainable and reliable energy supply. Um, at the moment, I mean, the positive news is that there are a very, uh, variety of, of wastewater treatment plants currently in implementation, um, and that if they are being rolled out and, and completed, they will be able to address the majority of sewage and, and wastewater that is currently produced. Um, but of course, again, many challenges, uh, energy, also the entry of material. Um, we still face the, the problem of how to enter dual use items. Much of the water and wastewater infrastructure relies on dual use items. So it's a continuous working um, with both governments and with the relevant administrations and the relevant authorities to keep it going slowly, step by step, to, uh, to make all these interventions happen. Um, and as I mentioned also as a first uh, issue, so we, we'd like to talk about all the technology and all the physical interventions that are necessary, um, but bearing in mind that the viable water sector reform is absolutely essential to implement uh, these, these projects in. So because you want re re cost recovery, you want clear regulation, you want people to have uh, a unified tariff structure, etc. 
Um, so there is, um, all, all this is actually available, but there needs to be a greater effort, um, especially from the Palestinian Water Authority, um, but also from the international community to support their work in rolling out this uh, water sector reform, which would greatly contribute to, to the, the financial viability of the sector, but of course also to attract further investments in the, in the sector in the long term. Um, thank you. That was it for my part. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, those are many steps that can be taken. And now um, I think Avram Tenen might have some suggestions that are possible just up the coast, uh, next door to Gaza. And uh, also, I just wanted to mention that last week we talked about the wastewater, and I don't know how you feel about it, Avram, but it was suggested that Israel, while a wastewater plant or can be built in Gaza, that Israel would receive some of the wastewater and send it back to Gaza because it could be treated in Israel. But you will give the technical okay. possibilities. So, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the SKF for inviting me here and to thank very much for the warm welcome and the very nice treatment and look how well I was developed since I arrived here. So really thank you. Now, uh, I would like to take a few minutes just to tell you a little bit about the Israeli water sector because from there we can take out, from there we can take out several things into the Gaza Strip problems and what can be, what can be done. So Israel, in the, last year, the first years of Israel, until about 30 years ago, was dependent only on natural water. And only after we faced a large crisis then, about 30 years ago, pumping too much from the aquifer and some other things, contamination, etc., we decided to go into water reuse. And from that time, from 30 years ago till now, we did a lot, we invested a lot into collecting the wastewater and treating them and sending them into agriculture. And the same uh, as in Israel, I believe that in Gaza, uh, I heard numbers of about 50% for agriculture. My belief, the numbers are higher. I think agriculture is taking more than 50% in Gaza. In Israel, it's about 50%. And today, after we are reusing almost 90% of our wastewater, Israel succeeded to supply to the agriculture sector about 50% of its water demand. It means 50% of the water demand, which is about 1 billion cubic meter a year in the agriculture sector, is supplied by water reuse. So there is a huge part of water that can be used, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. But this was not enough. So together and in parallel, to starting water reuse, we did many things in order to save water. And saving water means education, means getting the awareness of people from the kindergarten children to the adults to understand that water is a problem in our area and will always be a problem in our area. It's all, we will always face a shortage of water and we will need to do things. So awareness is very important. Then water loss in pipes is a huge problem. I heard in Gaza it's about 40%. I give a question mark because not all the water is measured. So I believe that the numbers are higher than 40% in Gaza Strip. I will not be surprised if the numbers are 50% and even higher. It means you take water, you treat them, you send it into pipe and you lost more than 50% into an aquifer which is contaminated that you cannot use. So water uh, loss in pipes is very important and this is something to do which is cheaper than desalination. This is really something that can be done and this is something that is doable even today. Then irrigation, the way we irrigate. In order to be able to save water in agriculture, you need to irrigate in the best way, on the best solutions. We heard today all kinds of uh, lectures about irrigation. These things should be adopted and really go into saving water through irrigation. You can save almost 50% of the water that you need in agriculture by good means of irrigation. And beside that, 
the water tariff. If somebody pays zero for money, he will never save. If for water, he will never save. So in Israel, we built up a tariff system that the water in Israel is not subsidized anymore by the government. It means there is no political risk anymore in the water sector that you change the government and the government changes its willingness to give or not to give water to, uh, money to the water sector. And this is another thing which is very important, the way you structure the pricing of the water. But all of this was not enough and we had to go and to produce new means of water. Now, in Israel we had, in the past, we had a very good technology about 4,000 years ago. You can read in the Bible, Moses, the leader of the Jewish people, took the people from Egypt back to Israel and he had a stick. And whenever he needed water, he just ate the rock and got water. No energy, no budgets, no banking system, wonderful technology. But we don't have it anymore, yes. But we don't have it anymore. And today, in order to produce means of water, you need to go into desalination, which is very sophisticated technology. And this is things that, again, should be done. And by going into sophisticated technologies, you need also to have the right manpower, the capacity building in order to be able to operate and build these kind of plants. So about 15 years ago, Israel decided to go into large-scale desalination. And today, we can say that we close the gap and we do and we did have a huge gap between the demand and the resources. Just a number, the, from the natural water we are getting, our replenishment is about 1.2 billion cubic meter per year. The demand is above 2.2 billion. It means a gap of more than 1 billion cubic meter a year we should close. We close it by saving water, by reusing water and by producing new means of water. So today we are really on the safe side, but it's today. Look into the future, all the long-term modules are showing that in our area the amount of precipitation is going down. What we had 30 years ago, today we have about 10, 12% less precipitation. And in 2050 we are going to have less 10 to 12% of precipitation all our area. It means we, the poor people regarding water, will get less and North Europe will get more water because the amount of water in the world is a fixed number. And population is growing. In 2050, we will probably face double population than what we have today in this area. So there is a lot of things to do later on to the future. For that, we build a master plan and we do know probably what we should do in the future in order to be able to supply the amount of water that's needed. Now going into uh, the problems in Gaza. And Gaza has many problems, uh, acute problems, and the problems are today. And depending on a large desalination plant that will be built in five years, my personal opinion, it will take maybe 10 years, even more, to have a large-scale desalination plant. So we have to be realistic and try to do whatever is possible now in order to ease the problem. And uh, Sherrod was talking about an additional of 10 million cubic meters per year, the type above the 10 that we are supplying today, another 10 million that probably an agreement of that is going to be signed in the next few months. But Israel can probably supply more than that to Gaza Strip. I personally are surprised why the Palestinian Water Authority didn't ask for more water in this matter. Of course, we will need to build more infrastructure in the Israeli side and in Gaza side, but it's doable. This infrastructure, this new infrastructure can take a year, two years, and we can have the means to supply more water. And I believe, my personal belief, is that Israel will be able to supply another 20 million cubic meter above these 20, which is quite quickly, and it's really something that it's next to this horizon. This is one thing. The second thing that uh, can be done is when we are talking about importing water, we can import water not only from Israel. We can import water, for example, from Turkey. 
In the past, Israel itself was looking into an option of supplying water or getting water, importing water from Turkey. This is something that it could take a year, a year and a half, and we have the means, the technical means, to get water from Turkey into Gaza Strip by tankers. It can be done. It's easy to be done. It needs financing. It needs all kind of international intervenience and that, but this is doable. It can be done. Then, if we are talking about desalination units, besides building a local desalination plant like the wonderful one that we saw just now in Charlotte's uh, presentation, we can bring in, or Gaza can bring in, containerized desalination units. These units, each container, can supply up to 1,000 cubic meter per day. Reminds you, 1,000 cubic meter per day, it means 1 million liter from such a container. 1 million liter. And take into consideration that a person needs about 2, 3 liters per day. It means 2, 3, 4 containers like that can supply the drinking water, not the showers, not the sanitation, but drinking water to supply the right quality drinking water and bring down the danger of the diseases that Yusuf was talking about. And beside that, we are talking about shortage of energy. There is a possibility to bring in ships that has a power plant on it and a desalination plant on it. This is something that, again, it's doable. Many companies are now looking into this option of building uh, ships with desalination units and power stations on these ships. It can be, again, this is something that can be done in a, a range of about one and a half to two years. It will also probably uh, will give answers to all kinds of security problems that we have between Israel and Palestinians. So it's another thing that can be done. And bring to that the water reuse. As Yusuf said, about 50 million cubic meters a year of wastewater is going to the sea instead of being used. Imagine 50 million cubic meters per year. It's about 50% of what agriculture in Gaza Strip needs. If we could collect all this water and operate it, and of course we need energy, and of course this energy can be supplied, by the way, even through agreements with Israel. It can be done. It's doable. It can be done. It's a matter of to get the real stable and real uh, confidence that this electricity that's going to be supplied will be paid. And this is part of the problem, but it, again, it can be done, and we can operate the existing uh, wastewater treatment plant and build up a system to supply this water, this very good quality water for agriculture to the people in Gaza. And I'll add something else, which is something quite new, but it's now going on in the world, several uh, new technologies taking the solid waste, the municipal solid waste, gasify it, produce electricity, and from this electricity you can produce energy and or desalination. And by doing that, you take, first of all, you take an environmental problem that is there, Instead of uh, dumping it or keeping it in large piles, use this raw material and produce energy. This is a new thing that I believe, and I will be able to talk with you later on on this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Avram. I think you see here there are possibilities. And I think we know in general there are possibilities. And we just have to now talk about this. Yusuf, you put, put forth the problems. And uh, Avram shared that you put forth what can be done, what's necessary. There's so much technology. And it exists right up the coast. So uh, how can we make it happen? I think this is the big question. Let's hear from the people first. And then we can conclude. OK. Are there any questions or suggestions? Uh, in terms of the priorities of these solutions, 
what would you say would be the first solution that could really get off the ground, you know, in the next year? I know Avram mentioned some timescales, but what would you say would be the first priority that will really alleviate the situation to the greatest possibility? Import water. It's the, it's the easiest, it can be done tomorrow. The infrastructure work that is needed even on the Israeli or the Palestinian side can be done, as Abraham said, maybe in two years um, or maybe quicker. But in the 10 MCM, the 10 million cubic meter can be delivered tomorrow if an agreement is reached on pricing. Uh, from where from where? From Israel. Yes. Me, me, uh, it's okay, and I agree with you. We we should have more water from uh, the Israeli uh, water authority through Mekarot. We only have one uh, now uh, 10 million cubic meter, which is not enough, as I mentioned. But if we import more water, uh, 30 million, 20 million, whatever, I think it is will be helpful. Uh, but I would like to say something. I'm sorry, and why I'm talking about, when I prepare this presentation, I feel this is the first time to me to join this uh, conference. And uh, I feel, in, uh, I have to put the fact, because my presentation, not the presentation for conference, but it is this such conference for the first time for me uh, to, f to join this conference. I felt I have to put the fact, and I would like you all of you to know what is the situation in Gaza. I'm sorry about it. It is, uh, I feel even not comfortable when I'm talk like this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, so thank you very much. My name can, is Munqid Mehyar. Can I'm I just, the, before the question, just to add something go else. Ahead. When we are talking to import, it's not only importing water, I think also importing electricity. This is again something that it's doable and we do can Exports from Israel into Gaza, more electricity today. It's just a matter of willingness and a matter of the payment. That's all. The technology is there. And if I'm talking like an engineer, the engineering solution is there. But the problem is the political engineering. And this is mainly the problem we have to face with this. Thank you very much for the last remark. My name is Munqid Mehyar. I'm the president of Eco Peace uh, Middle East Regional Organization in the region, Palestine, Jordan, and Israel together. Um, a lot to talk about, really, and uh, a lot of comments, but I would like to uh, start that uh, I still feel that we are really neglecting the big elephant, yani blue, white, whatever it is, which is occupation, the siege on Gaza. I think the international community and even the Gazans themselves, they are ready to do so much inside Gaza if they get a chance to do so. This is one. Uh, secondly, I, I think that there is a lot of self-interest for both Israelis and Gazans uh, uh, to talk about. As uh, well as we know that the currents in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean go up north and all this polluted water, it goes to the shores of Israel. We submitted an information request about uh, uh, a year ago, uh, and we found out that the uh, desalination plant in Ashkelon been closed for a few times, more than three times, and more than three days sometimes, just because the pollution coming from Gaza. And that is a huge economical uh, uh, um, uh, downfall for the desalination plant. Uh, it's that, for the right. self-interest of Israel that Gaza will stop sending all this polluted water to the Mediterranean as much as it's their interest. Uh, that's only a comment on that. The, my, my question to you, sir, Mr. Tennant, which I thought in the beginning that you are hijacking our next session on agriculture. Thank you very much for all the information you have supplied. Um, so we can talk more in our session, in fact. Uh, but I want to ask you about totally something else. I heard that uh, because you have an excellent desalination program, uh, that you have even an excess of water uh, from desalination, and you are thinking today of sending desalinated water to Tiberias. Is that true? Thank uh, you. This is the plan of journalists. 
Trump would call it fake news. <laughs> okay. No, no water is going to be sent to uh, Tiberius. The way to work is to pump less from the Sea of Galilee. We don't have even the means to send water to Tiberius. This is another thing. But just a remark on the Ashkelon plant. Ashkelon plant was never closed because of the Ashkelon, no, not Ashkelon. Usually we close several plants, but from pollutant that came from Israel rivers, not from Gaza Stream. Not that we don't see and we don't get the wastewater through the sea, but the salination plants can deal with it. It is a problem, we have to deal with it, but again, to do it, Gaza people has to invest more in their plants. They need to have the energy to operate their plants. Yes. So it's not so simple to tell them don't send it to the sea. We have to give them the means to operate the plants and to produce the treated wastewater that they could use. Okay? But I have to add something. Yes, I agree with you. There is a contamination for, uh, for Ashkelon regarding the, the wastewater you see. Uh, in Gaza, from Gaza, but uh, how we can manage to do it without electricity? We don't have power. Before I came, uh, four years, four days ago, I was in the beach, make a, a last round before I came to this conference. I know what I am going, I w which sort of questions I will have. But unfortunately, all the wastewater treatment not, doesn't work because of the electricity. And this is the major issues in Gaza. We don't have electricity to run all, all, the, all the wastewater treatment plant. That's it. Sorry, uh, if I may just comment a bit, Yanni, on that. When I started with the issue of self-interest, this is what I meant, that you need to do more cooperation. Of course, cooperation requires the political will before you do that. And if there That's is right. a political will, I think the solution is there. You will be able to get more... Uh, energy from Israel and even to produce your own yani solar energy is very rich in, in, in Gaza also and and uh, uh, Israel is very rich in, in the gas findings today so energy I think it's not a main problem it is in a way on a long run but yani it's, it's the political world that you really need to solve first thank you energy becomes a political issues because you know everything to talk anything to talk about Gaza and Israel, uh, it is a political issues. Because nowadays, you know, the situation uh, between Gaza and Ramallah is complicated, and that is reflect the relationship with Israel or the everything, electricity, whatever. But water is the of Ramallah, right? Yes, and this is the questions. And electricity as well. I would just like to come back to something Miriam mentioned, which is could Israel treat um, Gaza wastewater and resend it into Gaza for agricultural usage, for example? Israel can do it, but this is the wrong way to do it. I mean, it to say Israel can do it, you are talking about a project of five to ten years now. It's not doable. Well, let's be serious. We are doing it from wastewater that we are getting, example, from Nablus. We are getting it through a small creek, a small river, and we treat it, not because we want to do it, because we have to do it, otherwise it's contaminating the same aquifer that both nations are pumping out from it. But at the end, it should be done in Gaza, and the Gaza people should use it. Israel should not be a subcontractor for Gaza, they should really be able to do it at their own expenses. Yes. This is going to be the cheapest way to do it. Yes, I, I'm, I think it, he's right. It was a project. It was a project, and Professor Aluna Dar itself, he mentioned that more than times. Yani, uh, he was talking about uh, this project. But unfortunately, you know, the political issues is very difficult. Uh, otherwise, which is we have to know, even with, when we have electricity for uh, now, the wastewater treatment in Gaza nowadays is still semi-treated, not completely treated, secondary treatment. 
because able you know to can uh, reuse the wastewater treatment uh, for agriculture purposes we cannot use it only semi treated because we only have uh, all uh, all the wastewater treatment plant which is close to the sea uh, it is for short time it is not a permanent uh, plant you know wastewater plant it is it will be in the eastern part of gaza strip not in the west all the wastewater treatment plant in gaza are located in the west along the sea we call it emergency project i can call it and all the people it is an emergency project it is not a permanent project because of that they make they have semi treated wastewater the outlet not fully treated uh, about this waste uh, treatment uh, plant which you say rightly so that it's very old but suppose it fails because I don't know there's no electricity for several days there is a real danger that there's a, an epidemic an epidemic of cholera and then of course everything the whole region including Israel would be affected That's so right. in some sense you're right to talk about the, the politics but people should realize that there is a common danger because of the proximity of this, it's just a very small space. That's right. I agree with you. That's right. Even, you know, we, I'm not going, I would like, I don't want to talk about uh, disease. It's something, another story. But from my uh, studying, you know, fields and then uh, with my students and my colleagues, uh, really, if we, I would like to talk about the water related disease. It's something terrible. I cannot talk about it now. But really, this is very complicated and dangerous. I think the most frustrating thing is that there are solutions, or at least there are steps that can be taken and can be taken very quickly. And uh, if we could only get all the people together, uh, I think it's possible. We have to work on it, and we have to believe in it. Yeah. And we will make a list of the technical possibilities and try to sell them in the market. <laughs> May I add some small comments since we are sitting here in the Sharing Knowledge Foundation. And I think one important thing that we can do without a huge investment of the national uh, community with small money to get some more education to the people in Gaza on the water issues. From the kindergarten to the high school and universities to teach them about water, about can be done. And I am so pleased that it gave us opportunity to meet together with Professor Yusuf and really try to do something. I think this is a person that is in the education system and can really bring up and push such an idea. And I think that if you will allow us in the next few weeks, let's say, we'll send some information what we suggest to do in such a matter and have our, our contribution into the area of the water in this, in this really difficult region. Are there any other comments, suggestions? I think if there was this initiative, you could write us. As you know, we have a website, which is a think tank, and if you would like to have a contribution to that effect, we'll be get, glad to publish it. Good, thank you. I think I just had a question maybe for Charlotte because it's something you, you mentioned. Um, I mean, increasing um, the um, infrastructure in Gaza in order to allow for more water to be important from Israel will need material that could be considered as a du potentially dual users material. Um, so how, I mean, how to address this uh, danger and how in, in the current situation with the blockade, you think that there'll be an environment that would allow material to enter the Gaza Strip in order to increase um, the existing infrastructure? Thanks. Um, well, if you're talking about infrastructure, just to say upgrade the domestic uh, network in Gaza, you're talking mainly about pipes and pumps, which are not the main issue. Yes, they're also on the dual use list, and yes, there are also difficulties. Um, but they get in, um, they get in through the GRM, the Gaza Reconstruction Mechanism. Um, there, there can be delays, there are definitely issues within that system. Um, but 
it should be able in and, and the, the relevant uh, donors and, and, and project managers say that implement these projects are, are able to book success there. Um, so right now the, the German cooperation has funded a big wastewater treatment plant. Um, so they, they have to upload all the material in this GRM mechanism. It needs to be approved. It's a whole process, but, but it works to a, to a certain extent. Um, so I think for, for the domestic network in SE, it's not the, the huge challenge. The huge challenge is for um, desalination on the large scale um, and extensive wastewater treatment as well, but mainly desalination. And for this, um, the, actually now the Office of the Quartet has, is brokering kind of an agreement between um, the government of Israel and the Palestinians on how to import this material and monitor the, the implementation of this material because this material is likely not to go through the GRM as it exists because the project is very complex, very large scale and will be uh, implemented over very long periods. So they are looking at a mechanism that will be largely modeled on what, what is existing. Um, let's call it the GRM2 uh, and we'll take from the same modalities as exists today but we'll specifically uh, deal with this project, so there will be a designated unit focusing um, within CLA Gaza, focusing on how to import this material and how to implement it uh, in Gaza. But this is, of course, I mean, it's a big issue, and um, and, it, and it needs to be addressed for every every project, for every little pipe and every little issue that needs to go in. Um, they fa they face potential difficulties. It's true. Uh, just uh, let me. Oh, sorry. Add something to that. Uh, you know, there is another fact actually. Uh, unfortunately, it is any يعني bad, not good. All my presentation bad, not good. <laughs> the news is not good. You know, we have mass management in Gaza, and this is uh, it will be a big responsibility because of that. But what happened? I'll give you an example. We have two Palestinian Water Authority, right? We have one in, in Gaza, one for the local government, one uh, follow the Ramallah government. And the Palestinian Water Authority, and this is Palestinian Water Authority. Now, when you have any project or any idea, right, you go to what? Which one? This is a problem. If you go to the, the first one, the main one, which is follow Ramallah, and then he wants to have land to do something. He has to go to the, the other one to get permit, to, get, to have a land to do something. It will be conflict. It will be conflict. The same thing for environmental uh, utility. That's it. This is one example. A few years ago that the management of water in, in Gaza was not in the hands of the government dominated by Hamas, but of local municipalities. Is this still true or not? Not true. Not true. No, it's not true. I think in general, uh, if we address the political issues, I think on both if, sides. If, if you go tomorrow to yeah. Gaza and you would like to have an, a project or an idea, which one you have to go? That's it, the questions. When you go, if, when you go to Ramallah, Sultan Mia, Rib Sheikh, we call it, his name, Engineer Rib Sheikh. He told you, okay, but I will have, I have difficulties. I have a, a lot of difficulties, so and so and so and so. Because we sit together, we are academic stuff. I'm not uh, any governmental, uh, uh, I'm not going to work with the government. I'm not working at the university. We have a water research center. I know what I'm going to do, but this is. Would the solution then be to have an international water authority, as it were, which would be controlled by, I don't know, the United Nations or USAID or Agence Française de Développement, and that would uh, support, uh, with a charter, the management and the distribution of water? I rather think it should be a bottom-up kind of plan, because having gone through the offices also in Israel, in order to bring our friend Yusuf to this meeting, I went through a number of offices in order to get the authority. So I think it's bottom-up. We have, that's why I mean a shopping list. What do we want done? 
and then see how it can be done. Because if we're going to establish another, yet there are enough, enough authorities around, I think on both sides, we just have to keep sitting together and making our shopping list. So, so we haven't Sorry. heard what, Yusuf, what Dr. Yusuf is proposing, to bottom-up approach or to shopping list. I think in the, in the whole story of Gaza, the whole presentations, if you go back five years, is the same, 10 years is the same, 15 years is the same. So we haven't moved any forward. The political will is a necessity. The political will is not existing. So what do you do? We are not no longer want to teach kids to solve the problem because they're going to solve the problem later on. There's a lifeline issue here. That's the urgency now. It's not education. It is actually how do you get water to those people and how do you get it quickly? And I think Charlotte presented some kind of agenda in this regard, and it works, it's workable. Maybe the only thing that Israel fears is misuse of whatever comes in. Maybe an international, some kind of international police force should be put in Gaza to watch things that come, to see things being installed in the right place, because the first question is, can Gaza do it without Israel? Yes. But you need the money, and you need the facilities, you need the, the equipment and the material to come in. If, that's, if that can be done, put some kind of international force or something there to make sure the port is handling the proper materials, that is going to the right construction, and it gets constructed. This is the quickest way and the only way, believe me. There's nothing else that's going to move other than this way. And if I may, this, this say watchdog already exists. I mean, the GRM system is working mainly with UNOPS the, as from the UN as an implementer. Uh, and this mechanism for the large-scale DISA would, would probably work with the same actor and UNOPS would be involved there together with UNSCO. So, so the, ground there. the ground is there, yeah. Okay. Any last words? Any last words? Last words, thank you very much. I am sorry about uh, any disturb you. <laughs> no, no, you're I'm not sorry, disturbing. really, I'm sorry. Even myself. <laughs> thank you very much, and we'll may, continue to... May, may oh, I, Avram. Yes. I got some freedom from my wife, so I take this opportunity. Uh, what I want to say, and I said it many times, all over the history, water was a reason for war and for conflict. It goes all around the world. We should take it and have it as a bridge to peace. And this is what all of us should do, a bridge to peace. Thank you very much. <laughs>